Okay, welcome to everyone joining us. Um, we're going to give a couple of minutes to let our attendees uh, come in. Um, thank you for joining us for uh, Heritage Week. We are hitting the midway point now, so uh, we've had a lovely week so far. And just to remind people while you're joining, um, we are recording. We are um, broadcasting also to our YouTube channel and um, we will be taking questions. Your cameras will not be uh, shown other than the participants and the hosts here, um, but we would like to hear from you with uh, questions later on in the recording. So just as you come in, um, please can you um, maybe have your um, smartphone handy. Uh, we have a, an audience participation tool called menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. If you can go to that browser page and if you can put in this code 39674143 and we're going to pop that into the chat box as well as you come in a few times. Um, what we'd really like to do is um, ask you a couple of questions before we go over to our speaker for the evening. So uh, perhaps if we can ask, I can see a few people already participating. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes just to um, pop where you're from, which would be great. Um, so just while you're doing that folks, um, I'm just gonna uh, make a couple of introductions. My name is Georgia McMillan. I'm um, currently researching Dark Skies uh, through my position as Mayo Dark Sky Park Development Officer, and I'm supported by the Irish Research Council and the National Parks and Wildlife Service. I am joined this evening by my co-hosts, uh, Claire Masterson, give us a wave, Claire, who is the Project Officer for Dark Sky Ireland, and by Margaret Flaherty, who is, give us a wave, Mags, is uh, Mags Flaherty is the Supervisor Guide of Wild Nathan National Park, which is the home of Mayo Dark Sky Park. So uh, just before we introduce our main speaker, um, to point out a couple of um, uh, housekeeping, we have a chat box at the bottom. We'd be delighted to hear from you in the chat box. <clears throat> we also have a and a box, and that is where we ask you to please put your questions uh, for later on. So any questions only in the Q&A box, and we will come to them uh, a little bit later. So um, before I introduce Travis, I will just share our um, screen so you can we can see where everybody is from so just one second now um, this is looking great so we can see people coming from Mayo of course um, we have Belgium we have Wisconsin uh, we have Dublin hi Dublin we have Fording Bridge I'm not even sure where that is so we must find out wherever Fording Bridge is perhaps you can drop that in the chat of uh, Castlebar, County Mayo, we have Greystones, Kildare, UK, welcome, uh, Wexford, Carlo. So we have uh, all Ireland, Slovenia there, all Ireland, and um, indeed um, Europe, and probably further afield. So we're going to leave that open just for a few seconds, and then we will go to our next slide. Um, let me just see if I can do that while we're on here. I should be able to. So we have another question for you now, folks. Um, again, just before we begin, what is your interest in dark skies uh, or light pollution? Do you have maybe a background in ecology? Um, do you, um, are you a general public member? Um, let us know where you're, you're coming from if you can. And if that's not working, maybe you can give me the thumbs down. Mm. Yep, we have some people entering. Great. Okay, so okay, good. welcome. So we have some lighting professionals. We have ecologists that seems to be coming through strong. We have students, local authority, dark sky advisor. That's great to see. Welcome. Okay, I'm going to leave that open just for a few seconds and I'm going to start our introduction. So um, we will be moving on now um, and uh, to our main event and our special guest. Um, so I will stop the screen share in a few seconds. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Travis Longcore. Dr. Longcore is Associate Adjunct Professor at the University of California, Los Angeles uh, Institute of Environment and Sustainability. He is also Science Director of the Urban Wildlife Group, a nonprofit conservation organization 
and a consultant and advisor on ecological restoration projects using landscape architecture. Together with Catherine Rich, he co-edited Ecological Light Pollution in 2004 and Ecological Consequences of Artificial Light Nighting night lighting in 2006. And these publications have come to define this rapidly growing area in ecology. So I'm gonna switch off. I think we've got a, a lot of uh, different um, interests there. I'm gonna switch off the screen share so that I can introduce them properly. Uh, stop share. So it is certainly um, not only a pleasure, but an honor to introduce you at uh, Dr. Travis Longcore and to thank you for joining us and to welcome you as our guest this evening. I'm going to Thank you. put the spotlight light on. So just okay. a second, we'll spotlight you. And All right. There you go. Great. Thank you for joining us. Um, well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for everyone who's uh, come out whatever uh, time of day it might be for you, wherever you are. Um, a good e evening in, in, in Ireland, uh, for sure. Um, so let me share my screen here and see how I've done. Okay, there we go. Slide hopefully is coming through here. We'll talk today about the ecological impacts of light pollution. And so first I'll give you a little bit of uh, history about uh, how I got here and started on working on this and then go over some of the big uh, effects, the categories of impacts of uh, lighting on, on wildlife and, and on ecology, and then get into a bit about how we mitigate that and why uh, different strategies we might have, we think might might work for mitigation, especially when we start looking at at um, at wildlife. So I'm really delighted to be here and uh, able to talk to you and, and hope you can put your questions in the question box. And I don't know if the chat is enabled or disabled, but um, uh, feel free to pop in there as well. As, as Georgia mentioned, um, we got started on this actually Catherine Rich and I did uh, back in the, the, the late 90s. Uh, she was uh, interested in pursuing this as a, a topic. Um, and in graduate school, we were both in graduate school. And we, we ended up uh, uh, getting involved actually in an advocacy issue, which was the Vincent Thomas Bridge in, in Long Beach, uh, which is uh, was proposed to be lighted by spotlights, a lot of them very bright going directly into the sky. Um, and uh, that gave us the opportunity to bring this in front of a regulatory body, which was our coastal commission that regulates development on the coast in California. And it was became, we got together a coalition of uh, ecologists and uh, astronomers. And it was the first time that the California Coastal Commission had ever declared that the night sky was a coastal zone resource that needed to be protected. And out of that, the president of the uh, International Dark Sky Association at the time uh, was talking to Catherine and said, do you think you could write a white paper um, about uh, about the wildlife piece. He says, I'm, I'm okay explaining that, that light pollution is a bad deal for astronomy. Uh, and there was some very early work on human health. People generally understood the cultural uh, implications of losing the view of the night sky, but he found it hard to convince people that wildlife was a real problem. And so we thought about that a little bit. And there was stuff written at the time. Uh, there was a great review by a guy named Alan Outen in the UK. Um, I think Bob Mizon's book was out, which is quite good. And I think he might be here tonight, um, if I remember correctly at the time. Um, but uh, we thought we can't really do better than these things that are there already, but we could try to get together all the ecologists that are working on this as sort of an incidental topic across the different disciplines of, of biology and get them together and, 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 and have a conference. And so we put together the first international conference on the ecological impacts of, of light at night on wildlife uh, in, in, in 2002. And that got covered by this article here on the left, Blinded by the Night in, in Science News. And around that same time, 
the National Park Service here in the US was starting to uh, do its all sky imagery. And that got covered, there was an article here in 2004 where that was going on sort of uh, at, the, at the same time. And we put together the, the conference uh, uh, work into a, into a book in uh, a paper first in 2004 called Ecological Light Pollution, where we really tried to you know, uh, do what uh, Bob had, had asked and distinguish between the impacts on ecology versus the impacts on the night sky. And to distinguish between, because some of the solutions for light pollution from a astronomical perspective, the, 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 the not being able to see the stars because there's so much light up in there, that's bad for ecology. But some of the solutions could also not be full solutions for wildlife. If you shine a, a light downward uh, so that it's a dark sky compliant, it may be shining into a wetland. And there may be a lot of things that are very sensitive to that light that we need to be caring about as well. So basically, we made that distinction and sort of tried to lay out <clears throat> a, uh, you know, a field that, that this is something that we should be uh, concerned about. Then from the, the folks who had participated in the conference, uh, we uh, edited uh, this book in 2006 called Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting. And, uh, and that kind of brought together, we think, really for the first time, um, the ornithologists with the herpetologists, uh, with the entomologists, uh, and, and, and with the mammologists, and, and even a, a, a botanist uh, to be able to kind of have a comprehensive view at that time of what we knew uh, about the effects of artificial light at night on, on wildlife. And of course, things have, have grown dramatically since then, but it's really all about this, um, which is, uh, you know, recognizing that this is not just something that's incredible from a human experience perspective. This happens to be the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. That's a little campfire over there. There's a tiny little bit of light pollution on the uh, on the horizon. There's a hemispherical image. Uh, uh, you know, the entire horizon is is is, is all around the circle. Um, that this is an incredible human experience. But this is also the natural condition, minus that uh, little light on the horizon, uh, for all of evolutionary history, and and something that species have evolved with and adapted to, and have really complex and and finely tuned systems that react to it, um, and and in fact require it and require the dark of night as much as the light of day, and so compare that with if I were to go. I'm sitting here basically um, in West Los Angeles. And if I were to go out in the, our mountains here a little bit, uh, um, this is what our night sky would look like. About the, it's an extended uh, uh, exposure photograph. That's about as good as you're gonna get locally here. Um, completely washed out, quite bright, um, measurable. You can see the light reflecting off the landscape. Uh, and that's all from basically uh, Los, the greater Los Angeles area. This is on a site that's quite, you know, not itself developed at all. Um, and yet at this is the situation. And then if you go into a park called Griffith Park, which is this huge park in the middle of Los Angeles, and you take a picture um, with the, when there's clouds, it, it looks like this. Um, and, and that's the clouds reflecting the lights of Los Angeles back down onto the park. Uh, and really this park never experiences anything dimmer than about at least twice as bright as the full moon. Um, it is just incredibly bright all the time, even though it's, uh, you know, a thousand acres of, of, of open space. Um, and I forget the exact size. I'd have to look that up. Uh, but uh, so this is what we're, we're dealing with is this loss of the night sky. And under normal circumstances, uh, clouds would make it even darker. If we think about the land that our forebears uh, lived in and what it must have been like to go out on a moonless night that was cloudy, those clouds blocked the starlight. Uh, it would have made it so dark you couldn't see. But instead, today with our, our city lights, clouds make it even brighter uh, than it would be otherwise. And so we end up with this, this uh, situation of of loss of a, a, a uh, natural condition, the, the, the lunar cycles, we've lost the lunar cycles here in Griffith Park and many places close to, to urban, urban areas. Um, and we've lost the signal of day length over the course of seasons. We've lost um, the, the, both the, the, the fear for ourselves, the sort of frightening darkness 
Um, but also that darkness is a refuge to other species. So I want to talk to a little bit next about my sort of four general categories of how lights impact um, ecology and, and species and habitats. And so these aren't the only ways you could divide these up and there are other uh, ways to do it, but I think of four big, big bins. One is attraction and disorientation. Uh, lights uh, attracting the sort of ones we know really well, bats get attracted lights, insects, uh, birds. Uh, a second one is the loss of connectivity, which has to do with sort of fear of lights, that lights break up the landscape and species that specialize in darkness can't move across it then. Um, and then the third bin up in the upper right there is interference with pollination and foraging and basically all these inner ecological interactions that are governed by visual processes on the part of one organism or another. It may be the pollinator, uh, you know, relative to the plant. It may be the uh, predator relative to the prey. Uh, it may be uh, a prey species wondering how safe it is to go out and, and forage. All this sort of inter interactions that, that are much more subtle and don't leave dead bodies on the ground. The one on the left, attraction and disorientation, that leaves dead bodies on the ground, and we're pretty good at recognizing that. But the ecological interactions are just as deadly in terms of removing the, the, the necessary habitat for species by taking away the lighting conditions, the darkness conditions that are required for them to function as they have through their entire evolutionary history. And then the final bin are all the sort of physiological uh, cycles that go on inside of organisms in response to light cycles. So that's lunar cycles and seasonal cycles and daily, the circadian rhythm uh, from day to day that, that are really are then sort of manifest an individual expression of uh, conditions within the organism, what hormones they produce, etc., but also their daily activity patterns. So we'll go through and look at these and I've uh, sort of chalk them up by, by category. So this attraction bit, we, we know this and we've known it for a long time and you all know it if you've ever had a porch light or a flashlight that's attracted a moth at a campsite. Um, uh, and, and so organisms being phototactic, positively phototactic, meaning attracted to lights um, is, is, is pretty widespread. Here's an example of um, uh, migrating songbirds attracted to the Eddystone light. This is a painting from uh, 1912. And they get uh, sort of caught in the beam, attracted to it, and then they are don't want to lose the beam. They end up on the lighthouse. But if this is a city light, they end up in the city and running into windows. Um, or if it's uh, on a cruise ship, they end up uh, running into the windows on the cruise ship or sitting and resting on the cruise ship if they're lucky uh, before they, 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 they are able to escape in the next day. Um, really long uh, standing. So just to give you a sense of, of what that looks like, uh, this is a, a video looking up into the Tribute in Light in New York City, the 9-11 Memorial. Um, and those are all birds that have been attracted uh, to those lights. That's why this memorial is only on a very limited uh, time during the year. And if they get too many uh, birds in the beam, they actually turn the, uh, the lights off and let them dissipate. They've looked, used radar, uh, weather radar, to calculate the number of birds. You can go from, you know, 500 birds in the within a kilometer or two of this memorial, you turn on the lights, and then within 20 minutes, you've got 5,000 birds or more. It is really dramatic. The birds are migrating at night because that's when it's advantageous for them to do that, both from a protection from predators and for their heat balance, it's cooler. Um, but then you turn on the lights and there they are. And then uh, the left side is an example of birds that then are attracted to lights like this and then run into glass in, in cities afterwards. This is uh, collections um, at, at the base of buildings uh, after a night uh, during the migratory season. Just to give you another example of how this works, this is Bonin's Petrol. This is a great paper by my colleague, Aaron Rodriguez. Uh, and they shared these, these uh, animations as part of their paper. This is the juvenile uh, fledgling uh, petrels coming off of their nests, uh, which is that one point where all the lines start. And the first two uh, ones, this will repeat through, the first two ones get to the ocean safely, which is what we want them to do. Um, they see that one out to sea and the second one there out to sea and this one up oh, there's some lights and oh, there's some more lights and third one goes up the 
the other lights. So the thing on the left are the lights and the thing on the right is the map. And so what you can tell here is that at least of, I think there's six or seven petrels that they tracked uh, with GPS here, uh, the majority of them ended up grounded uh, where the brightest lights are. Um, and so this is just like um, a really graphic illustration of this attraction phenomenon and what it means, especially often for juveniles, uh, juvenile seabirds, uh, where they're, they're coming from burrows and they need to be able to get to uh, the, uh, the, the ocean and they just don't. And the thing is they can't take back off once they're on the ground. We've got to rehab them and toss them off a cliff so they can get a little uh, lift uh, to be able to uh, get, you know, survive. Of course, you got to catch them and the cats can't get them before you do uh, at, at, at these particular sites. Insects attracted to um, lights, we know this uh, from, from many studies. Uh, this is an example from the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, these are lights uh, on the left installed at a petroleum site for the first time in a rainforest that's never had lights in it. And you can see just the number uh, and diversity of insects that are, that are there. Uh, the thing on the right, uh, you can see there's a black background and a yellow, um, a yellow, uh, so basically it's a filter there. This is from an experiment that we ran with this Smithsonian, uh, that's one of the experimental lights to see if we can reduce the attraction of insects using different colors of lights. And we'll come back to that, to that, to that later. Um, here's just an example of a, a, a simple, oh, a simple art piece. And is that going to advance? No, it is not. I, maybe. Um, even this uh, one light in the middle of a square, this is my colleague Gerhard Eisenweiss in Germany, ends up with all these insects attracted to it. And then they end up basically fried on this lens because the light is hot enough to heat the lens up and they get on there and then they're desiccated um, and, and quickly die. So there's, there's literally billions of insects uh, that we're killing needlessly every year through the choice of our lighting. And those are insects that then aren't fulfilling their role either as, I'll be frank, uh, bird food um, or doing other useful things in our in our ecosystem, like pollinating our plants, uh, as example here of this uh, hawk moth uh, with nocturnal pollination. So we find, and there's been great research over the last couple of years documenting just how much lights impact pollination, and not only pollination at night, but spillover effects. Because if you have less pollination at night, you end up with less seed set, you end up with fewer plants growing and then you can get a decline in the daytime pollinators as well because you don't have the same survival and productivity of the plants. Uh, and I have to call, credit Eva Knopp and her lab uh, for, for that incredible uh, research uh, where they document all of these interactions. Um, just to give you a sense here about uh, the sort of predator prey relationships, or at least we assume this is what's going on. This is a recent study that my uh, students and I did on the coast of Southern California, looking at two different uh, beach organisms. One, the Western snowy plover. Um, you have a similar plover uh, in, the, in, the, in Ireland as well, I believe. Um, Kentish plover, I'm trying to remember. Um, but um, it, it's, a, it's a beach obligate. It roosts on the beach, it nests on the beach, it forages on the beach, it's a beach species. Um, and maybe some flatlands inland uh, that have water on them, but mostly beach here in Southern California. And then the California grunion, which is uh, the lower there, which is a, um, a fish that actually comes up on the beach to spawn. Uh, so during the high tides, the females and males both come up, the female wriggles her back into the, uh, into the sand, and then the male fertilizes uh, the eggs as they're deposited in the sand, and then those eggs will hatch at a subsequent high tide um, after they've had time to, uh, to produce. And so we invested the, we have a bunch of data about where these things are going on because of community scientists who uh, track the, the grunion and also track the plovers, which is an endangered species here in the US as well. And um, so the blue dots are all Western plover spots and the, the yellow dots are all California 
the Runyon. And then we created by going out on the beach and measuring, and I'm not gonna bore you with how we did all of that, but we created a layer of how bright it is on the beach um, as well. And we ran some models to try to figure out what explains where these two phenomena are and how does lighting relate to it. Uh, and what we found was that for a plover roost, the chances of finding a plover roost go down dramatically after you get to about 0.05 lux. Now, 0.05 lux, of course, is a measurement of light on a surface as the human eye sees it. So it's biased towards humans. We'll get to that issue in, in, a, in a little bit. Um, and a full moon, the brightest full moon you've maybe ever seen is maybe two tenths of a lux, maybe three tenths of a lux. The theoretical absolute maximum is four tenths of a lux. And if you were like, in the tropics with the clearest skies ever and the biggest super moon you might imagine. But a typical measurement in Los Angeles would be a tenth of a lux or a two tenths of a lux. And what we find for both of the, for the plovers, your chance of there being a roost goes down dramatically. And this is after accounting for other things like how wide is the beach and how far are you from the beach and how far are you from freshwater, which they like to be near. Even after you account for all those things, there's this huge signal. It's like the first or second most important variable is how bright it is. And the interesting thing about the grunion, they will increase in the probability of finding grunion spawning up to about a lux. And this is without the moon. I should be clear here. This is without the moon added in. This is all measurements taken during the new moon where there should be basically uh, order of magnitude or two darker than this. Um, but at a, above about a, an artificial moonlight's worth, then you start getting a reduced probability. So these start to give us some thresholds to understand where um, impacts are happening. And also bo for both of these, the presumptive mechanism are these interactions, predation risk. Uh, the brighter it is, the greater chance predators are gonna find both of these. And they're probably adjusting their behavior here and choosing spots where they don't have to be encountering the brightest lights. We also can illustrate from Los Angeles uh, our very Hollywood mountain lion. Uh, this, is a, this is a mountain lion that's in that park I was telling you about, Griffith Park. Uh, is, is, here he's right under our, our Hollywood sign in a photograph that was done for National Geographic. In that park, we have one mountain lion, a, a male named P22, Puma number 22. And he's become a bit of a local celebrity. Um, but one of the things that uh, is a problem for mountain lions in general is finding their way from one habitat patch to another, which is why it's so remarkable that this mountain lion found it to this park through a very urbanized mountain range uh, that he picked his way through probably at night and uh, to get there. And so we have some evidence and we're exploring it more with studies across the state of California that uh, there's a decreased probability that mountain lions will use, uh, move across the landscape in places that are extremely bright. This one got here, He's, he had to go because if he'd stayed where he was born, uh, it's, it's the larger part of the mountain range, but his father lives there and his father would have killed him if he hadn't left. And he, so he, ha he had to escape somewhere. And, and so now he's living in this very suboptimal habitat, the smallest mountain lion range you might imagine because he's facing things like this. Um, and so this is a, these are two mountain lion habitats, both on either side of a large uh, divided freeway. This is some imagery that my student took uh, at, at a location where this is the best place for the mountain lions to get across that freeway, but there's this big lighting barrier. And, and we have research show, suggesting to us that mountain lions don't like to actually go in places that are overly lit. Um, and so the good news here is that there's going to be a overpass built over this freeway. Um, and that overpass, I'm on the consulting team that's helping to design it. And, the, and we're designing it to make sure that there is a path that blocks as much light as absolutely possible so that the mountain lion can see a dark path across the freeway and that the path he would most likely, or she in the future would most likely take is as quiet and dark as possible because noise is a, a synergistic disturbance along with light. But this is just sort of illustrating how lights you know, break up landscapes. Bats, for example, that are very light phobic will not fly over something like this. And, and so we have, 
and I will you know, point to Europe here, we have European countries who have been progressive enough to leave dark spots in the lighting along roadways so that bats can travel across them. Or to, and we'll get to this topic later, or to change the spectrum of light that they use in order to uh, minimize the impact on bats. Same thing applies to fishes, uh, lights going into a river. The fish, uh, as they move downstream after spawning, uh, will basically stop under a light like this. And we see this from lab experiments where uh, salmon that are in the lab and exposed to light, their, their out migration is behaviors are delayed uh, a, a period of time. So it's, it's affecting their movement across the landscape and creating a barrier, even if it's a temporary barrier in time. And then we have all of these, these um, circadian disruptions that happen, the daily cycles of light. And you're looking at this picture, you go, what is this? Okay, so this is a soybean field. And, um, and then this thing here, I hope you can see my, my mouse, is a street light. And the circles here are the extent of the street light into the soybean field, because these are uh, winter soybeans and they set seed when the day length gets short enough for them to, th I'm gonna say think in quotes, for them to think that winter is coming. And if they don't perceive that the day length is short enough, they don't set seed. And the farmer then has no value from them um, and they stay green. So all these green soybeans underneath the light have, have, have taken the signal from the light that their day length isn't getting shorter and that winter isn't coming uh, and they shouldn't set seed. Whereas the ones that are further away um, will set seed and do set seed. And so you can see that this is a physiological response to that, that light there. And this is just one of many, many examples. We have examples in birds and their stress hormones. We have examples of humans and their nocturnal hormone melatonin. We have examples all across across uh, the, uh, the both plant and animal and other kingdoms uh, showing physiological responses to artificial light at night. And then this one, just to give you one more example of this, uh, here's a reindeer uh, in, in uh, it's here in basically the summertime. And there was this wonderful paper, uh, it's now described this phenomenon where the day length of, uh, and the amount of light in the environment, the natural amount of environment causes the back of the eye of reindeer to change color from the summer to the winter. So this is summertime, very bright, you know, 24 hours. The eye is going to be yellow um, in this reindeer. And then during the, the Arctic night, uh, the back of the eye turns blue. And here's a picture of the two. Those are both from the same species, one eye from the summertime sort of built-in blue blockers, that yellow, and then one eye from the winter time trying to collect as much light as possible and, and, and using that blue to do that. Um, and so that is, because that's tuned to where the light is in the winter time uh, and, and able to then uh, detect it. And, and they did some work and they found uh, these blue eyes and, and, and yellow eyes, depending on when the reindeer happened to have died. Uh, and then they found some green eyes. And like, well, what's up with the green eyes? It turned out these were reindeer that were kept um, by the Sami in Northern uh, Sweden uh, in a pen in the winter time, not under street lights, but the street lights were just over a hill. So they weren't even, it was just, it was sky glow, reflected light from nearby street lights caused the reindeer to have their eyes adjusted to an inter inter intermediate state between the, the blue and the yellow. So it's a very finely tuned system uh, that they had have uh, that under natural circumstances would allow them to protect themselves from a lot of light in one part of the season and then gather a lot of light in the other part of the season. So then, so these are just to give you a sense of these categories of impact across all of, of, of life um, and, and going from the physiological up to the landscape uh, effect. And so then the question becomes, you know, uh, how do you minimize the adverse effects of light? And I want to go through these in order of priority. Uh, meaning uh, do the first thing first and the second thing second and the third thing third. And the first one is light only where you need to. Um, and this is, uh, seems uh, very straightforward, but in our world of very cheap light that's inexpensive to operate, people have a tendency to want to light things up uh, even more than they need to. Do you really need seven porch lights going around your house? 
I don't know, when I grew up, I had one porch light and we left it off unless we were waiting for company. Um, but now I drive around and maybe it's just the Southern California thing. There's people with porch lights all around their property and they're on all the time completely. Don't light if you don't need to. Two, turn them off when they're not in use, either manually or with a motion detector so that they're really only on when they're needed for the task that they need. And there are tons of applications for this, parking lots, for example, uh, that, that often get uh, lit for, uh, dusk to dawn and are really only used a portion of that time period. Those lights can go off. Use only as much light as you need and you'd be surprised how little you actually need. There are guidelines out there um, from international lighting uh, bodies, uh, this uh, International Engineer, uh, Illuminating Engineering Society, for example. Um, but hitting those minimum numbers is often good enough. Uh, not over lighting, absolutely critical. Direct it only where it's needed. Uh, that means using shields, thinking about things, even if you're doing dark sky lighting and the, 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 the criteria is there be full cutoff so that no light goes up, think also about where the light going down is going. Is it going into a habitat? Is it going into a creek or a river or someplace that it isn't actually needed? And using optics or shields in order to get the light where it's needed on the path, on the road, on the, the uh, patio or whatnot. And then finally, using the lowest possible correlated color temperature for the goal of the lighting. And correlated color temperature is a measurement of the spectral composition of the lighting. Uh, when we look at a, a white, quote unquote, white light, it has all the colors of the rainbow in it that we as humans perceive. Um, and the color temperature has to do what proportion of what wavelengths are in there. So a high color temperature has a lot of blue and a low color temperature has a lot of yellow. And I'm gonna demonstrate that uh, here in just a second. So those are the five in order of priority of what to do. Uh, and for those of you who are visual learners, uh, this is how that looks in a graphic form. Uh, part night lighting would be an example of only when you need it. Um, the uh, spectral composition using yellow as opposed to full light. This is directing the light where you need it, shielding the light, uh, going from sort of worst, uh, better, and best. And then issues about dimming, sort of having some sort of a dimming strategy, or just having the light at lower intensity. So these are all strategies that we can use that are very straightforward. Um, and that if uh, lighting designers understand why, um, I've always found uh, are able to problem solve and figure out how to achieve what they need to achieve uh, while, while following these, the, this guidance. So that's the, the sort of take home. I wanna go into a little bit and just demonstrate how it is that last bit about color temperature, why the color matters. And remembering that this is like number five, you do those other four easy ones. Uh, but then when we get to, cause it's sometimes you know you've gotta have light, it's gotta be a certain brightness, it's gotta be on certain times. And that's just how it is then what can we do? Then we're left with dealing with the color, the color temperature. So I want to just demonstrate how this works a little bit. Um, the background here in the, the bright color is the distribution of wavelengths in sunlight. Uh, it's, it, and it's 6,500 Kelvin. And so it's got a lot of blue uh, sorry, during the daytime. And this is like the, the ambient light during the day. A lot of blue, plenty of green and yellow and red. And also back down here, we get into the ultraviolet. There's light out there that we as humans don't see. Our vision, our daytime vision is, is this curve in the back. Okay. And then the, the, uh, the overlap between the two of them is that pastel color in the front. So what I take from this here, so human vision in the back, spectral distribution of, of, of daylight, and then the overlap is sort of how bright all that appears to us as humans. And so different spectral compositions of light are going to intersect with our vision in different ways. So here's a high pressure sodium light, the good old orange lights that have been used for 75 years uh, as outdoor lighting. It's a 1900 Kelvin, give or take which means it's uh, got a lot more yellow and red in it than it does blue. And then you can see in the back, I hope I put it on here, you can see the, the spectral distribution of it, uh, the orange, you can see human vision there, and then you can see the overlap. So there's still plenty of overlap with human uh, vision in order to be able to give us the cues that we need to see stuff. Doesn't tell us how well we see color. That's a whole nother question that we can talk about separately. Then you can 
convert, say, to a 4200 Kelvin LED. So this was like first generation commercially available and frequently often now deployed LED. Very blue. Because of the way that the technology of LEDs work, they have what's called a LED blue pump. Uh, and that's the blue LED here. And then there's a phosphor that's on the LED that then takes that energy and re-radiates it across the rest of the spectrum. But in these early ones, and even these high color temperature ones that are still uh, being used today, you have this huge spike down here in the blue and then the radiated light over there. And what you can see is there's a lot of that light that isn't particularly useful for human color vision. Uh, we use it uh, and it interacts a little bit better with our nighttime vision, but this is why those lights seem so bright to us uh, when, they get, when they get installed. Um, here's another LED. This is a 2200 Kelvin LED. And that blue pump has been diminished quite substantially and that energy is re-radiated back out into longer wavelengths. So still inter interacts quite well with our color vision. And and when we're dealing with car parks and porch lights and uh, sidewalks and all these sorts of things, we're really using our color vision, our daytime vision. Uh, we're not adapted to the dark of night because this is like three, four, five lux underneath these things. We don't need it to be adapted to our, our nighttime vision, which is more sensitive to those darker wave, those shorter wavelengths. Um, so then here's the melatonin suppression, melatonin being that nighttime hormone that basically every organism that has a circadian rhythm uh, produces. We like it because it keeps cancer at bay and it helps us sleep and it regulates hunger and all sorts of things go wrong when we don't have a proper melatonin rhythm. Well, that's because it usually works because daylight is like right there. Melatonin suppression uh, sensitivity is right there at the peak of daylight. When it's daylight, we're getting that message, our melatonin suppress. Much less under high pressure sodium, Right? There's very little interaction with that. So the melanopic effect, the melatonin effect of a high pressure sodium light, a low color temperature light is much lower than something like a 4200 Kelvin LED, which happens to overlap uh, quite a bit more with the melatonin sensitivity curve. Okay, so we've got these curves um, and then a 2200 Kelvin LED, we can do better. Still not as good as a 1900 Kelvin HPS, high pressure sodium, but better. And we can do even better than this with other LEDs, with filtered LEDs, et cetera. And so we can still, so the key here is that we can still hit our visual sensitivity while avoiding the melatonin suppression. And you say, well, what about other organisms? Well, here's moths. Um, so that's the moth attraction curve there in the background. There's daylight, huge overlap. Moths are highly attracted to short wavelengths and especially ultraviolet. Um, so if you've got daylight at night, yeah, they're gonna be uh, bothered by that. Um, here's a 1900 Kelvin HPS in moths, much better. Uh, here's a 4200 Kelvin uh, LED. Interesting though, the things that are really bad for moths are lights that have ultraviolet and luckily LED lights don't. So even any LED is better than our old mercury vapor lights that had ultraviolet. Here's a 2200 Kelvin LED, so better, right? So we can, we can start to discern uh, how much overlap we have with different areas of the spectrum and come up with better and best. And this is because other organisms have different visual systems. So humans see red, orange, yellow, green, you know, various blues into violet. And here, for example, deer and, and most deer uh, just don't see the orange and the red. And so if you want to go into a stable at night and be able to see and have the horses not be able to see, horses being close enoughly related to deer that they're, they share a similar visual system, um, use a red light. Um, and, and, and that will minimize the description on the, on the horses. Fun fact, I know because somebody approached me once asking how they should light a, a hospital for thoroughbred uh, horses uh, to minimize the disturbance to these very valuable animals while they recovered from surgery. Um, it, it, so that was a, a day's research and a very interesting answer, red. Um, insects see things that humans don't. So we need to avoid that. So ultraviolet, which is basically everything light with wavelengths less than 400 nanometers along the spectrum. So we see down to about here and over here is the ultraviolet pictured as violet in this, in this um, uh, image. And there's just a peak of sensitivity that insects have down here. So we want to avoid those things uh, while we can still see. And then what I've been doing for the past two years is tracking down every 
visual response curve from every single organism that I could find through all of uh, the scientific literature that has been ever published. And I've, and so this is not published yet. Uh, this is the first time, second time I'm actually showing it to anybody. Um, every one of these lines of dots up there represents the visual response curve, uh, either in their sensitivity as shown by behavior or as shown by electrodes we put in the eye to measure how much output comes um, or looking at the reflectance of the eye. There's three different ways that we can do it. But every one of those up there, there's about 160 of them, is a spectral sensitivity curve for different organisms. And the peak, so the, the average organism has a peak here about 525. Um, and this is daytime and or nighttime. And human peak sensitivity during the day is over here. Um, and, and if you divide it out, and I just here just simplify that, I took every 20 nanometers and looked at the average. So we can see that there are some species that have their peak sensitivity down here in the ultraviolet. Some have no sensitivity in the ultraviolet. But what's interesting, as we get up over here into the yellow and the red, the curve goes down much more than if you go over into the blue. Right, so if you take the go from the peak and you go toward the yellow and red side, that goes down more and faster than this curve here. And this is just like all organisms. And it becomes even more dramatic if we look at the difference between um, chordates, vertebrates basically, um, including humans, and uh, the the uh, the arthropods. The insects, the arachnids, the spiders, the scorpions, all they, they tend to have a lot more sensitivity in the ultraviolet. Some mammals do. There are plenty of mammal species that see in the ultraviolet, but humans don't. Um, so even if we just wanted to like move the lighting to benefit uh, things more like humans and less things like uh, insects, we would move it into the longer wavelengths. And we and so I've taken this down. So here we're down into the amphibians, the arachnids, the birds, the insects, the mammals, and the reptiles. Average curves curves for each of them, um, and you can see some patterns coming out birds more likely to see into the ultraviolet, insects more likely to see into the ultraviolet, some mammals into the ultraviolet, but it's only a, a portion of them. Um, and, the, and it gives us an opportunity to sort of give some numbers to this idea that if we move our lights, if we have to do something, we, we will overlay, and I haven't done it here, but we'll overlay the human sensitivity curve on here. And it pretty much is always over to the right, the longer wavelengths than these averages. And because of that, this is why now we can take these things, put them together with the spectral output of different lights. That's that D65 curve, the daylight curve I showed you before. These are different LEDs that might be using. We can take all of these curves, and remember now I've got 150 or 60 of them, and we can kind of figure out for different species or species group or overall, what's going to be the ones that have the lowest impact while still being visible and being able to achieve brightness that humans need at night. And that's, that's the, the work that I've been really uh, doing. If you remember the guys in the rainforest from before and that study with the filtered lights, it turns out using this approach where we overlay the sensitivity curves and the light output, try to predict how attractive something will be or how disruptive it will be, we nailed it. We predicted ahead of time the attractiveness of three different lights in this area in the Amazon uh, and our predictions uh, fit, right? So if our prediction was perfect, these the middle of each of these things would line up exactly and they're pretty darn close. Uh, a, a white light was more attractive, and these filtered lights reduced the attractiveness by about 30, 40, 30%, which is about what we expected. Maybe it was 25% uh, for one and 30 for the other. So that's, um, that's evidence, because we made the prediction ahead of time, went in the field, collected the data. Again, my colleagues at the Smithsonian did all of that, um, and then we're, found the results, and it was consistent with this approach of matching up visual sensitivity and predicted attractiveness curves against the wavelengths of the light and it worked. Um, we did it as well within lights of the same color temperature. This is work I did with students at UCLA. We had uh, light to the same color temperature where we adjusted the way that they achieved that color temperature by reducing the insect attractive uh, wavelengths. And we were able to reduce the attractiveness of a higher color temperature light. This is an LED at uh, 3000 or whatever I said there, uh, 3500. 
we got it to actually be less attractive to insects than a, a 2700 Kelvin uh, compact fluorescent. And then we had these other custom LEDs also at 2700 Kelvin. And 2700 Kelvin is about like your old incandescent 60 watt bulb. It's about that. That color. Um, and we could reduce, again, attraction uh, rather substantially from a compact fluorescent bulb, which is a very uh, 2700 Kelvin, which happened to have more light in the wavelengths that insects were more attracted to. So we used this approach, we, we predicted it ahead of time, and we got the results that we expected from the prediction. Um, and then the last one here I think that I'll show you is uh, experiment, again, unpublished. Uh, this is funded by the uh, California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, results that are just coming in now. We brought this into the lab and we looked at the activity of mice because uh, when they're exposed to light at night, they, uh, which is their active period, they get inactive because uh, they're nocturnal species. And so we exposed them to, to four different levels of light at three different color temperatures, a 3000 Kelvin, so like a neutral white light, a 1950 Kelvin and a 1750 Kelvin. So this is like high pressure sodium or less going toward that, um, that uh, yellow red uh, direction. And what we found was that there was an interaction between the two. The brighter the light was, the more suppression of, be of a behavior we got with the higher color temperatures. But when we got down into light that was about the same as or less than a half moon, there was actually species, some of these mice were more active than they were under our no normal conditions. And that's because the normal conditions for mice in a lab are like utter darkness. And um, that's not natural. They actually like a little bit of light to see. Um, and the, the light of a quarter moon or starlight is perfectly natural for them. So we actually found this sort of lab phenomenon where adding this light brought it into natural conditions. Whereas when you get past the full moon, that's still neutral at about five tenths of a lux and sort of past the maximum possible full moon. But once you get under five lux, you start seeing suppression of behavior and more for a high color temperature uh, bulb than for a low color temperature bulb. These things interact. Um, and this is for you ecologists out there. Um, so this is just showing as you change the intensity of light or you change the uh, color temperature, how much suppression of activity or in fact, um, uh, increase in activity you're going to get uh, at those different levels. So if you go to 50 lux and 3000 uh, color temperature, you get almost complete cessation of activity of the mice for that hour they have the light on. Um, and whereas uh, if you go down to 1750, uh, you get uh, less than that even uh, uh, at the high color intensity. And if you minimize both of them, you can actually get into something that's more like natural conditions uh, absent the lunar cycle. So this is why um, spectrum does matter as you get brighter lights, as you're looking at lights that are creating levels that are a lux and two lux and five lux and 10 lux and 50. There are places, um, I just reviewed a paper uh, that was had collected some fish from the shore of a, a water body in uh, Eurasia, and they had documented 250 lux uh, from the industrial activity uh, into that water body, which is just, uh, we know that at those levels, color temperature is going to be remarkably important for the out, out, outcome of what happens to organisms in that water body. So on average, and this is going back before I had the 168 curves and only had about 10 curves to work with, average wildlife sensitivity, greater impact as you have higher color temperatures, lower impact as you have lower color temperatures, but even variability within that depending on how that color temperature is achieved, as I showed you with the, the experiment with the insect attraction and the uh, custom LEDs. Um, so on average, lower color temperature. So, so we should, now there's one big caveat and I would be completely remiss if I didn't give you this one, which is this color temperature thing doesn't work if you're dealing with organisms that are tuned to the colors that you're putting out, like fireflies and glow worms and whatnot, which are tend to be very sensitive to the, the yellow greens and the yellows and whatnot. And you just, so, so if you go to yellow light, don't think that's a silver bullet. It's not. You have to do those other four things first and reduce that intensity, get it where it needs to go, turn it off when you can, you know, dim it as much as you can, and then go with the color. And even then, if you've got a firefly or a glow worm uh, and you're, you're, you know, basically camped out on its portion of the spectrum that it, 
it uses to detect other uh, members of the same species or sometimes of other species, um, you're going to have those adverse impacts anyway. So that I just put this here right at the end is like, huge caveat, it's not a get out of jail free card for your lighting designer. It's what you do after you've done everything else you can possibly do to be as wildlife friendly as you can. Um, so with that, a view over beautiful Los Angeles Basin uh, with a whole bunch of uh, high pressure sodium lights and uh, our Independence Day celebration going on uh, over top of it. Uh, I can uh, take uh, questions and uh, you can contact me at that email or my Twitter if you wanna uh, have a public conversation is at Travis Longcore uh, on, on Twitter. With that, I'll stop the share and, uh, and see um, how, uh, how many questions I've accumulated. <laughs> Thank you so much, Travis. That was absolutely fascinating. And the, the breadth of your work is so impressive. I'm kind of blown away. I have a background in ecology. And yeah, I just, I don't know how you've done it, but <laughs> to gather all that data has been amazing. So we do have um, a few questions um, for you. And I'll just go to the Q&A. The first question is coming from Megan Eaves. And she is wondering, have you or your colleagues ever mapped the impact of light pollution on species into a framework for ecosystem services um, or natural capital? And she said that she's very interested to have a chat or a look uh, on that with you. And they have some interest from the UK government yeah. natural capital team in adding darkness and light pollution to their framework tools. Yeah. Uh, I think the short answer to that is I haven't. I know people that are, are thinking in that direction. Um, I want to say uh, Sybil Schreier in uh, Franz Holker's group in uh, Germany, I think is thinking in that direction uh, quite extensively. And then of course, all the folks who are doing the pollination work um, and who want to carry on the great pollination work that uh, the late and Miss Doug Boyce uh, from the UK um, was doing. Great, thanks for that. But very interested in that. Yeah. Um, so email me. <laughs> Claire, do you want to go to the next question? You're on. I can, if I can figure out how to unmute myself, it would be fantastic. <laughs> Um, Steve had mentioned he he posted a question and and uh, then I see down further he he did see that you answered some of it but I'll, I'll go back over the question um, I guess that there is some still fixation on CCT uh, surely for human use we should be using CRI and for minimizing logical impact we should be looking at the SPD. Um, you can get lights with more blue than other lights with a lower CCT. Um, and he yep. recognized that most manufacturers don't give SPDs. Yep. Um, so yes, thank you, lighting expert. Um, yeah, so I know that CCT is a flawed metric and that, and as our, our research also investigated, you can achieve CCT, the same CCT in different ways. And the thing that really matters is the SPD. Um, however, because my goal has always been to try to do things that can be quote unquote translational, meaning it can go directly into practice and use, uh, it's the best thing that we have uh, at the moment uh, for characterizing spectrum. I would love it if every lamp came with an SPD file and we could just pop it in and the, the, the tools that we've developed and will be developing further you can bring your own spectrum and run it yourself and figure out what uh, what the impacts are be, how much it inter interacts with the moth attraction or or uh, human melatonin suppression, whatever you like. Um, so then the question about CRI, um, you know, CRI is tough too because um, you know it only re relates it to how well you should see relative to a black body of the same color temperature. Uh, so that sort of breaks down a bit as you get into lower and lower, um, lower and lower color temperatures. Uh, but there's there's obviously an active uh, research uh, groups around the, the 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 public safety elements of all of this, and I think everyone who works in this recognizes that we have 
uh, trade-offs to make between uh, public safety and, and wildlife slash ecosystem slash uh, human health impacts. And, and I'm on a couple of projects where we're sort of actively trying to have that interdisciplinary conversation uh, between the lighting engineers and lighting safety uh, researchers and the wildlife side to figure out what the most advisable things to do are. But thank, thank you, I really appreciate the comment. Thanks, Travis. And thanks to Georgia who put an explanation of one of those acronyms because I was a bit CRI, CCTV. Oh, SCT. color rendering index. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're CCT. Fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, no, and I did, perfect. oh, incidentally, I did write a little short piece for the um, Illuminating Engineering Society on the validity of different metrics, um, sort of composite spectral me metrics. Uh, if I find it here, I can, I can toss it in the chat. Mm -hmm. And because people have proposed other things like the ratio of light for spectropic vision versus photopic vision, the SP ratio, or the percentage of light below 530 nanometers or whatnot as these sort of uh, measurements of light spectrum quality. And as of a year or two ago, CCT was still the best summary metric as long as you don't have um, lights with ultraviolet. Um, so, uh, but we shouldn't anyway, because humans can't see ultraviolet and LEDs think, don't produce it unless you tell them to. I think you kind of hit the, the, the nail on the head towards the end when you said there was no silver bullet. And I think that's really what came across. And yeah, it's like with everything in nature, I think things are very complex. <laughs> Um, so we have another question from an anonymous attendee, and they are asking and um, about neuro neurodiversity in humans, and are there any noted differences, for example, in people on the autism spectrum um, and hypersensitivity to certain lights, um, rather than people not on, on that spectrum? Great, a really great question. I can only report anecdotally on this. Um, and, 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 and that is as follows. I have been contacted people and am in touch with people who are either uh, basically post-traumatic stress um, syndrome or autistic somewhere on the, that spectrum who express a extreme pain um, and intolerance of high color temperature LEDs. And to the point of it not being comfortable for them to encounter them and causing migraines. And the th theories, the possibilities there um, are one that it's the spectrum and that that sort of bright blue light is just uh, disturbing uh, because of its color. The, other th and, and often people in, in, in chat groups who, who share this, uh, this um, response will are perfectly happy with a filtered yellow LED. Um, the other possible difference could be um, that the flicker somehow is being detected because there is neurodiversity huge, even just in response to say melatonin uh, production. There's orders of magnitude difference at, at the threshold at which you see melatonin suppression between individuals. Um, so there are some people who maybe have their melatonin suppressed at, uh, you know, half a lux or less, and other people for whom it has to be 50 lux. Um, so we shouldn't ignore the fact that there is this diversity. Flicker fusion rate is like the, the rate at which a light has to be flashing for you to see it as solid as opposed to a flashing light. Um, and maybe there's some subconscious detection of the flashing uh, that, that's going on. The best lights shouldn't do that, but that could be there. Um, but, and there may be, as, the, as in the chat, some uh, uh, um, correlational evidence uh, around autism and light at night. But, uh, you know, there's a, we have to investigate all those correlative studies um, pretty seriously before we decide that they're causative. Um, said as someone who has published correlative studies <laughs> and knows the, the pitfalls there. Um, but, but I would say we should be aware of that and, and listen to people and what they say, because if we listen to that advice, 
we will create safer environments for everybody because that hypersensitive, hyper not as in a bad way, but just like super sensitivity to blue light is something that you also get as you age and the eye starts to uh, scatter uh, light more um, and you become more sensitive to the glare and those blue wavelengths especially. So if we think about inclusive design uh, and inclusive design, including the range of human perception under quote unquote normal circumstances, but we don't define being older as abnormal, right? If we do, if we do that, um, we should be pushing toward light that uh, doesn't blind people. And how, you know, the, um, the laser like car lights are, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you uh, as, as a great example of that right now. That's brilliant, Travis. Thanks a million. Um, it just goes back to to you know your first couple of slides that shows that you know the light levels don't just impact one thing on this planet; they're affecting so many things. So, like that, your research isn't focusing on how the light is impacting you know one community; it's it's impacting uh, you know so many different communities. Um, we have a couple of questions in from. Um, Friedel, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, some experience with adaptive lighting shows that in a lot of residential areas, 80% of the night is no activity. So currently the lighting is switched on 80% of the night for nothing. Um, for that reason, the following question, what is the most effective to reduce the ecological impact of light pollution? Is it adaptive lighting or change the spectral um, to yellow red? And also then uh, when going to local authorities, can, uh, can they use the, the slides that were, that were shown here today? And of course, with, with reference to yourself. Uh, okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Fidel. I know you're a long time and accomplished uh, dark sky uh, defender and uh, really appreciate your, your question. Uh, so what's the, I think the question is like, what is the order that we should be going at th things? Dynamic lighting, first or color first? Yeah, uh, I, well, the, the, uh, the greedy person in me says, well, why not both? Uh, but if I'm pretty clear now that um, I would try to make as much progress as absolutely possible on limiting the time that the lights are on and their brightness and dynamic lighting. Um, dimming, et cetera, before I go down the color temperature road. Um, I, I, and that's just from, from the, I've had a, I think my views have been evolving on that, especially this, this mouse study that we did. Um, you know, it just really kind of illustrates that how the color of the light doesn't matter if you can get it dim enough or off. And so let's, let's go for that first, but then offer um, the supplement of getting a lower color temperature uh, after after that. Um, and if they're unwilling, especially if they're unwilling uh, to do anything else, I'll take it, right? I mean, this is the, this is the whole the whole name of the game here is make the progress that you can make. Uh, so the question, can you use my slides? I would prefer that right now you don't use the ones that say long core unpublished because, um, you know, I got to get those submitted to Caltrans and then published. Um, but but I'm happy if you uh, use pretty much everything else. I think I forgot to put the photo credit on the soybean picture, which was a new one. I used to have an old one, uh, but that the site that the old one was from got turned into a Walmart um, shopping center. So it wasn't the greatest example anymore. Uh, but uh, Go ahead and get in touch and, and, and we'll, uh, if you've got specific questions about slides that you'd like, because I'm guessing screen capping them from a international Zoom session is probably not the highest fidelity way to do so. So, so go ahead and get in touch. That's great. And that soya bean photograph was amazing to demonstrate that 
that effect of light. Um, I think there was a couple of comments about how effective that, that photograph was. Um, we have time for one more question, but I might ask you two. Um, so the first one is coming from Charles, um, and he is asking whether your um, the sundial bridge example from California, would you expect a similar spread of color sensitivity with different types of fish and sharks? Um, somewhat, it depends on the environment that the fish and sharks are adapted to. Uh, and I haven't, I should have said that that, that uh, 160 some curves that I did, that was a focus on terrestrial species. Um, and so I haven't, and, but there is a one fish curve and the one that I know offhand is, um, is, is, is similarly sensitive towards the blue, but fish that are in different turbidity um, conditions uh, end up being sensitive to different colors. So, and we have a little bit of a summary I, in the fish chapter in the 2006 book about spectral uh, sensitivity. Um, and somebody wants to take it on or fund me, we'll do the, we'll go search the literature for the fish curves next. Well, hopefully there's somebody online that can maybe fund that, it would be great. <laughs> and um, Bob Meisen, so um, nice to see you here, Bob. Um, Bob wrote a really nice poem actually about um, the Dark Sky Park in Mayo. And um, um, Bob wants to know, have you any further books planned? <laughs> um, great question. Um... Well, I know that Bob knows how much work books are. Um, we, Catherine and I have contributed to a, a book that is coming out from the uh, uh, Dark Skies Working Group of the uh, IUCN about uh, dark sky places and examples around the world, including uh, some reviews of, um, of the wildlife impacts. I have on my medium term list, the idea that we should uh, uh, update the 2006 book uh, and do a, a second edition that's updated from the real profusion of research that's gone on around the world. Uh, the question is how, as someone who has to fund all the work line by line, I'm not a, uh, I'm not what you call a real professor, I'm an adjunct, which means I get to raise the money uh, that I get paid. And so, um, figuring out how to free up the time to do that is, is one of the challenges, but we'd, we'd really like to. Great. I, I've just jumped in, really, I suppose, because of the time. So um, thank you, um, firstly, to our co-hosts, to Claire and to Mags. Thanks for um, ably managing those questions. They were very technical as well, some of them there. So um, thank you both. And Travis, what can I say? Thank you. I know um, I'm always sort of following you on Twitter and all the work you do for Dark Skies and educating us so well on light pollution. So um, it really is um, it's a delight for us to, to, to welcome you. And um, I know we mightn't be able to, to get you to travel over to Mayor, but maybe we'll have you again one day um, to, to do another talk for us because it, it really is information that we so badly need and we need to share it with a multidisciplinary forum of people, which we, we do have here today. So I'm, I'm thankful to everyone who's joined um, for from a number of different backgrounds. Um, so with that in mind, may I um, close the, uh, the, the webinar and um, thank you again, Travis. Thank you to everyone who has attended tonight. Um, just as a reminder, this is Heritage Week. Uh, we are funded by the Heritage Council for our project in Newport on lighting. And this is one of the events that we've organized as a result of that. Um, and our lighting will be done as sensitively as possible and taking a lot of the information that we've had learned today and, um, and through our, our lighting design forward. So we hope um, to show you some results of that in the coming months. Um, Travis, I don't know if you have any any parting advice or, or comments before we close off? But one one tiny little comment and, and as a thank you. And also, you know, being at a certain point in, in life, I, Mags, you like, how did you do all that? And, and I wanna I wanna just say something that uh, an older colleague of mine said um, uh, some years ago when I looked at what he had done, I'm like, how did how could you possibly have done all that? And he said, Well, you know, it's just kind of like knitting. Um, you just have to start and you just have to keep knitting 
and before you know it, you've got a sweater, but you don't think about it while you're doing it. You just got to keep knitting. Um, so whatever it is that you're doing, however you're engaging on this topic, uh, you know, whether you're an advocate or a scientist or just somebody who's trying to, you know, open the eyes of your children to the natural world, um, just keep knitting um, and you'll be amazed at what you end up with. That is a brilliant way to close. Great advice. Um, so thank you if we can all, all take a little bit of that. Okay, folks, we'll have a great evening and Travis, a great afternoon. And um, thanks again, folks. Look forward to seeing you another time. All right, take care.